So here, The Verge reported, this is, this is the first like headline, the well, second headline, but The Verge was the first news source that I saw reporting on the whole Microsoft possibly buying GitHub. And then obviously they came back and they confirmed that Microsoft confirms is acquiring GitHub for 7.5 billion. That's a billion with a B uh, dollars, which, wow, that's, that's really impressive. Um, so let's go ahead and see what we can deduce from this article real quick. Um, I also love this little slide. I think they took like the slide that where it said Microsoft hearts Linux and they just put the GitHub thing on it, which is pretty, pretty funny. <laughs> um, so yeah, so obviously the first paragraph reads, uh, Microsoft is acquiring GitHub. After reports emerged that the software giant was in talks to acquire GitHub, Microsoft is making it official today. Uh, this is Microsoft's CTO, Satya Nadella, second big acquisition following the 20... 26.2 billion acquisition of LinkedIn two years ago. GitHub was launched at a two billion, uh, ba was valued, sorry, at two billion back in 2015. And Microsoft is paying 7.5 billion in stock for the company in a deal that should close later this year. So that's, that's pretty interesting there. Like they paid 7.5 billion in stock. Wow, I mean, I mean, owning Microsoft stock alone is is pretty pretty impressive, and having seven billion dollars worth of it is is wow. That's that's a lot of money in stocks, Microsoft stocks. Um, so and then it goes on to read, you know, GitHub is a large repository that became very popular with developers, companies hosting entire projects, documentation, and code. Apple, Amazon, Google, and many other tech companies uh, use GitHub. There are 85 million repositories, 85 million hosted on GitHub. That's, see that right there is why a lot of people started freaking out. Uh, 85 million repositories hosted on GitHub. Imagine all that code. Of course, a lot of it, you know, is open source and it's, you know, covered under GPL or some kind of BSD license or MIT license. So technically, a lot of those licenses don't allow you to basically purchase it unless it's being sold to you. Um, but so technically Microsoft doesn't own that software, but you know, still people still freak out. Right. And that's the main, main reason why they freaked out because it is now, they now own the company that hosts 85 million repositories, which is crazy. 85 million repositories hosted on GitHub. Wow. I mean, that's, that's, that's really impressive. Um, so, and they also go on to say GitHub will now be led by Nat Friedman, the founder of Xamarin. And let's see, what else? What's another little good piece of interest? Um, oh, Microsoft killed its own GitHub competitor, CodePlex, in December. Let's see what else here i think we will accelerate enterprise developers use of github with our direct sales and partner channels and access to microsoft global cloud infrastructure and services says microsoft ceo Satya Nadella. so that's kind of like the big uh the big takeaway of the story here you know that you know github needed cash basically they needed money they needed some way to kind of continue going because they didn't quite have that enterprise adoption yet. Um, they they were obviously you know there was some big companies you know, on, on GitHub, but I guess they they weren't uh, moving as quickly as they needed to to gain those big accounts. But of course now that Microsoft owns them, Microsoft has like a, a ginormous sales team that basically they they can you know just call up anybody and they'll say yeah we'll go ahead and use we'll switch to GitHub basically. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of like their saving grace. So that's kind of like, you know, this is the biggest reason why GitHub, you know, basically uh, decided to sell to Microsoft because Microsoft has a big sales force. You know, they have a big uh, sales department and, you know, you'd be kind of dumb not to basically at least consider that. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the biggest take away, you know, here. Um, you know, Microsoft is, you know, really, really, really going all in on making sure that developers stick to their platform. Um, so that's kind of like the, the reasoning there. 
Uh, and then this paragraph is pretty interesting. It says, uh, trust and respect won't be easy for Microsoft to win. Uh, developers are already voicing their concern about Microsoft past abuses and the company's botched acquisition of Skype and Nokia's phone business. GitHub itself hasn't, uh, hasn't scaled well and has faced its own issues over the years. And they are legitimate concerns that Microsoft will need to address. GitLab, a GitHub competitor, claims that it's seen a 10x increase in the amount of developers moving their repositories over to its service an early sign that there are some developer unrest. So this is the main reason what we're doing this today because you know GitLab, a GitHub competitor, claims that it's seen a 10x increase in the amount of developers moving their repositories over to its service. So obviously, like I said, the interest over GitLab has grown and a lot of developers are just freaking out and they just want to move their code. And of course, 85 million repositories worth of it. If imagine if all of them moved over, obviously not everybody's going to move over, but just imagine if like a large percentage of them were to move over. I mean, that would be like absolutely insane. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's really really interesting to see how all this played out. Um, so that's why today we're deciding to basically take a look at GitLab and see how it functions how it works so also i should give a little p you know a little warning i'm not the best user of git <laughs> um i've i kind of just know the basics <laughs> so don't you know paint me as an expert in git or anything like that like git is like one of the things that i i i ashamedly don't you know <laughs> i'm very ashamed that i don't know very well and of course i mean i'm not like a you know, big programmer and like that, or like, I, I you know, I, I just don't know it very well. Obviously, I have used Git, Git, Git and GitHub a lot because there's a lot of cool code that's on there. And a lot of people host their stuff on there. And for this reason, you know, I go to GitHub a lot to kind of get some cool software. And so, yeah, so again, a fair warning, I'm not the best Git user. <laughs> so it'll be kind of fun to see, you know, me stumbling over all of this and trying to learn how all this works. So, okay, let's go to the next little thing here that kind of got people a little um, uneasy, I guess. So the Linux Foundation, the Linux Foundation itself, uh, the headline reads, um, Microsoft buys GitHub, the Linux Foundation's reaction. This is by Jim Zemlin, which is, I believe, the, um, the president of the Linux Foundation. Um, so this is here, uh, this week the Microsoft announced that it's acquiring, it is purchasing GitHub for 7.5 billion in stock. I waited a few days to write up my thoughts because it, this is something that deserves some thoughtful reflection. The bottom line, this is pretty good news for the world of open source and we should celebrate Microsoft's smart move. But before we get to that, it's worth noting that I have been working in this dynamic space for many years and the differing reactions of to the announcement remind me of a few things so basically he's saying yeah it's cool i think it's cool i mean why wouldn't anyone else think that it's cool um and i understand their reaction you know because the linux foundation was basically established to kind of court uh large enterprises to kind of come use linux and to kind of give the, the linux foundation and the linux kernel development uh process uh basically money so they can continue you know, developing the kernel. So that's the main, I guess that's the main, uh, one of the main goals of the Linux Foundation to kind of, you know, basically get money for the development of the Linux kernel. And so anytime a large enterprise does something that, you know, incorporates, or I guess not corporates, but I guess uh, uh, somewhat benefits the open source world, the Linux Foundation is going to be pretty okay with it. Um, because again, their job is to get money for Linux kernel development. And, you know, we've also know that Microsoft is one of the biggest contributors to the Linux kernel. And, you know, they also own a board seat on the Linux foundation. So it's kind of like one of those things like, okay, you know, this is the world we are in now. So everybody kind of calm down and understand what's going on here. And like the world is not falling apart. You know, this is kind of like how business works. This is how business function. These kind of things are going to happen. 
and we need to be aware of them. And so everybody calm down and kind of think this through. So that's that's kind of like Jim Zemlin's, um, the president of Linux Foundation's kind of like tone here. It's like, okay, this happened. All right, let's take the time to really understand what's going on. And uh, let's just celebrate the fact that open source is the reason Microsoft is buying GitHub. And isn't that a cool thing? Like, you know, we've always said open source is cool. Open source is awesome. And now people are coming to realize that. And big companies like Microsoft are betting on open source. And, you know, but the main reason, again, is, you know, why people um, freaked out of this. Because, again, Microsoft was the company that not too long ago called Linux a cancer. You know, they described it in those words. And they basically did everything that they could to basically kill off the Linux kernel development, kill off open source, uh, kill off free software, and have their products and their software be the dominant force in the industry. Of course, you know, people being people, and, you know, and, and I mean this in a nice way, you know, if, if you're gonna if you if you're gonna build uh, something, you're more than likely gonna build it on the cheap because you know you're just starting out. You may be in college or whatever, and you want to use something that's free. You may you may you may not have any cash, and you need to use something that's free. You're not gonna use a super expensive product from Microsoft that you know they basically have full control over, and you can't build something really cool off of that if you don't have big pockets to begin with and there's a lot of great examples of that kind of stuff i mean facebook wouldn't be facebook today if you know if basically if uh, mark zuckerberg was building facebook on net instead of php um so things like that you know if if he was using a windows server as opposed to an apache server or ng uh, nginx server or whatever he used in the beginning um but yeah, so, you know, a lot of great projects, a lot of great businesses that exist today would not be around if it wasn't for open source. And so now Microsoft understands that. And now that they have this new CEO, Satya Nadella, oh, well, you know, he's been around for a while now. But this new this Satya Nadella really understands this push for open source and understands that Windows is not the product of Microsoft. You know, Microsoft is the product of Microsoft. And so they're going to offer all kinds of services around that. You know, that's why they made this big push to cloud infrastructure with their Azure platform and things like that. And, you know, they they love that slide of, you know, saying it over and over that Microsoft loves Linux now. You know, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt or whatever you want to do with that. But, yeah, that's that's the idea. So, again... Microsoft buys GitHub, people freak out. The uh, Linux Foundation gives their feedback on that, kind of tells everybody, hey, chill, everybody be cool. This is happening. It's still like technically a whole year away from being complete. You know, we don't know what's going to go on. Maybe they might, you know, not sell after all. But, you know, these things are more than likely going to happen. It's gonna, probably going to go through and GitHub will be owned by Microsoft. So we'll have to wait and see um, what uh, Microsoft does to GitHub in terms of like how it integrates with its own products. Who knows, it might be a really good thing for GitHub and it might be a really good thing for developers. And if Microsoft really truly is honest about like that they love developers and that they love open source and that they love Linux, you know, they may be that thing that you know, really takes Linux to the freaking next level. I mean, it's going, it's been going on this upward trajectory on its own. And imagine what we were to do if like another big enterprise like Microsoft were to take it to another level. I mean, that would be really cool. I mean, we have like companies like Amazon and Google doing really cool stuff with Linux and taking Linux to new and bigger levels. I mean, imagine what would happen if, you know, Microsoft were to come into the ring. I mean, that would be really cool. I mean, that's just my, my, I guess, my hope for Microsoft, 
you know, not being evil <laughs> and not messing up with, you know, the whole open source uh, ideology and philosophy and, you know, development cycles and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like the whole news behind, you know, GitHub being acquired by Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So now let's go ahead and see if we could take a look at the GitLab and see what they're offering. So, okay, let's take a look at that. So, over here, let me switch. Over here, we have GitLab. And this is the alternative that everybody had been switching to. Um, well, not everybody, I should say, like a lot of people. Again, not everybody, because it's 85 million repositories were on GitHub. Not all of them are going to move over. Um, but yeah, this is one of the you know, other alternatives. There's plenty of other alternatives to GitHub as well that use uh, Git. Um, there's like Bitbucket, there's SourceForge and all those kinds of uh, platforms. But a lot of people liked GitLab and a lot of people saw GitLab as like the primary, you know, uh, competitor to switch to. Because again, like I mentioned before, uh, GitLab has its open core component where you can download the 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 software and install it on your own server, basically. So let's take a quick look here. Um, GitLab, a 200% faster DevOps cycle. So the other thing about GitLab that you know marks itself different from GitHub is that GitLab wants to be your basically your entire you know DevOps you know stack. So they want to be the place where you not only host your your repositories on. But, you know, in the background, it'll run tests for you. It'll check your software and do all that automation kind of stuff that it comes into ensuring that you're, the software that you're basically putting out is working correctly and, you know, is error free, basically. So we'll get into that a little bit more right now. Um, here they have a little chart here. You know, spend more time writing code and less time maintaining your tool chain. Uh, so they have a little chart here you know, that kind of describes your stuff. Um, so let's see here, um, uh, with GitLab, you can plan, get the best, uh, get your best ideas into development. So it's here, whether you're waterfall, agile, or conversational development, GitLab streamlines your collaborative workflows, visualize, prioritize, coordinate, and track your progress, uh, your way you, with GitLab with flexible project management tools. So you see right here, just with this, uh, GitLab like integrates basically project management tools into their their um, platform, which one of the biggest, you know, things that people really liked about, you know, GitLab as opposed to GitHub. I think only the Enterprise Edition had uh, this kind of stuff built into GitHub. Um, create, uh, securely write and manage code and project data. Consolidate source code into a single DBCS uh, that's easily managed and controlled without disrupting your workflow. GitLab's Git repositories com come complete with branching tools and access control, providing a scalable source, a single source of truth for collaborating pro on projects and code. So here we go is with the whole repository management and all that. Uh, verify, ship better software faster, spot errors sooner, improve security and shorten feedback cycles with built-in static code analysis, code testing, code quality, dependency checking and review apps. See, that right here is like one of the biggest selling points for GitLab. Um, the fact that you can integrate all your, you know, basically um, all these really cool, um, you know, DevOps, you know, tools into just one platform. That's really, that's pretty cool. Uh, customize your approval workflows automatically. Test quality your code and spin up stage environment for every code change. GitLab continuous integration is the most popular next generation testing system that scales to run your tests faster. So that's pretty cool. Package, uh, manage custom container images with ease. GitLab Container Registry gives you enhanced security and access control of the custom Docker images without third-party add-ons. Easily upload and download images from GitLab CI with full Git repository management integration. So earlier I said about the whole container craze and everybody's going crazy for containers. Containers is the big thing right now. Now, GitLab now has basically container, you know, uh, 
uh, it says your GitLab container registry. Basically, you can manage your containers, you know, ship new containers whenever you want. Uh, that's pretty neat. Uh, release, Minis minimize complexity with built-in continuous delivery. Build less, spend less time configuring your tools and more time creating. Whether you're deploying to one server or a thousand, build, test, and release your code confidently, securely with GitLab's built-in continuous delivery deployment. So this is kind of like, you know, when people need to get their software out to basically send updates to their software, things like that. You know, it's all built in within GitLab, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so now next, configure. Automate configuration management, automate your entire workflow uh, from build to deploy and monitoring with GitLab Auto, DevOps, best practices, templates that you can get started with minimal to zero configuration. Then customize everything with from build packs to CI and CD. Well, that's pretty cool. And then finally, monitor. A monitor and manage application performance. Ensure your applications are always responsive and available. GitLab collects displays performance metrics for deployed apps using Prometheus, so you can in an instant uh, you can know in an instant how code changes imp uh, impact your product production environment. So there you go. You can see all these things in, uh, in the fly. Uh, with using all these cool little things uh, within the Git, GitLab platform. Uh, visible, real-time view across the entire lifecycle, see everything that matters, stay in flow, don't wait on syncing, manage projects, not tools, improve cycle time, efficient, collaborate without waiting, start immediately, work concurrently, no more handoffs. Govern, develop and operate with confidence, securely and compliance already built in. Simplify user management, expedite auditing, act with certainty. Uh, integrated teams working together, GitLab plus cloud, Google Cloud Platform, work concurrently, no more handoffs. Dev QA security and operations are part of a single conversion throughout the lifecycle. Detect problems early by shifting them to the left and solving them without delays. Teams work at the same time instead of waiting for security QA and operation handoffs because teams are Backlogged. It's pretty neat. Uh, try GitLab Ultimate for free for 30 days. That's pretty cool. And then we have some, you know, over here some uh, little testimonials. We see what this guy says. Watch Amir. He says, We decided to use open source based platforms so we could participate in development and contribute to features concepts we need, such as files, size statistics, OpenID Connect, GPG. Uh, Docker registry, GitLab's built-in continuous integration and de uh, dependent CI runners uh, allows our developers to integrate very specific environments, boosting productivity and increase developer, developer satisfaction. So that's pretty cool. Uh, new features every month. That's pretty neat. Uh, let's see here. Some little testimonials. Join GitLab, GitLab blog, Cloudhouse live demo. And that's it. This is all right. So... Sign up, get out black. So let's see what we have under product over here. Okay, so an overview, real quick overview. Uh, GitLab is the first uh, single application for all stages of DevOps lifecycle. Only GitLab enables concurrent DevOps. Unlocking organizations from constraints of the tool chain, GitLab provides unmatched visibility, higher levels of efficiency, and comprehensive governance. This makes the software lifecycle three times faster, radically improving speed of business. So that's pretty cool. Uh, plan, create, verify, packages. Again, this is things we saw on the homepage. Uh, oh, this is cool. GitLab is open core, which provides users with an access to source code and ability to modify it as they wish. So this is one of the, again, the biggest, one of the biggest uh, things that people uh, liked about uh, GitHub, basically. Or GitLab, I should say, sorry. Um, bah, bah, bah. Choose the version best for you. Let's see, what's the best version for me? Um, core, get the de full DevOps lifecycle to build, deploy, and run your application. Zero dollars per user per month. Uh, community supported, built-in CI, CD, issue boards, AD, LDAP integration, see all features. Starter, for organizations starting to adopt DevOps, focusing on automating um, automating build, test, and governance of the development cycle, uh, $4 per user per month. 
What else have we got here? Premium organizations progressing digital transformation scaling to develop usage additional deployment capability, $19 per user. And then the ultimate, which is you have to call them up. Uh, pretty cool. Let's see. Of course, we're, today we're gonna be signing up for the core. Uh, but, oh, 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 here. Here's the cool thing. Uh, core, this is what you pay for for self-hosted. So in other words, if you were to download the software and install it on your own server, which we're not gonna do today, maybe some other day we'll do, um, you would get, you have to pay zero dollars for the core. Like this is, again, this is the main big thing people would like to get lab for. Um, and then you pay $4 for user for starter and so on. But if you want to get lab to host your repositories, you would put it like the same way GitHub does it. Um, this is the pricing for that. So, you know, basic, almost basically the same thing, basically, yeah. Oh yeah, basically almost the same thing. Um, so in here, and yeah, almost the same features as well, some slight differences. So if we were to do the free one today, We'd be doing 2000 CI pipeline minutes per group per month on shared runners, unlimited private projects and collaborators built in CI CD, psychoanalysis, analyst, analytics, sorry, uh, issue boards, time tracking, preview changes, review apps, publish static pages for free with GitLab pages, and get LFS 2.0 support. So that's pretty cool. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and sign up. Give me one moment, everybody. Okay. I just need to pull up my email so I can have everything ready for everybody. Um, just quick, oh, taking the scores of the World Cup. Apparently, Argentina and Iceland were playing today, and it looks like they ended in one in a tie, one one. That's pretty cool. Mm, let's see who else plays today. Today, Peru and Denmark play. Um, the game should be starting soon. Croatia and Nigeria also play today at 2 p.m. And tomorrow we have Costa Rica and Serbia, Germany, Mexico, uh, Brazil and Switzerland. Those look like really good games. So, just pulling out my email now. So, let's see here. Still waiting on that. A bit slower than usual. Okay, so one more thing real quick. Okay, so let's register full name. I know this is super exciting, guys. I'm gonna move this over here so you can have a quick read of all this stuff over here while I sign in over here. Do 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 do. And boom, we are now signed up. Cool. 
Alrighty. So, now that we're signed up, let's see here. It says, welcome to GitLab, code test and deploy together. So we have, let's take a look at the options first up here. Projects, we have your projects, start projects, explore projects. That's pretty cool. We have groups. Your group is a collection of several projects. If you organize your projects under a group, it works It works like a folder. You can manage groups, members, permissions, and access each other, each project in the group. Explore public groups. Look at that. Cool. All right, activity. Your projects, star projects, push events, merge events, comments and team, milestones. Open, close, and all snippets. Your snippets, explore the snippets, nothing here. Uh, this looks like a, the snippets looks like the, what's it called? The, the thing that uh, GitHub will allow you to do to basically, um, oh, what's it called? Kind of use it as like a, a quick way to share code with people. Hmm. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, okay, let's go back to original page here. What is this? New project group snippet uh, issues. Over here we have uh, merge requests. Here we have tools. Tools let you see what you should do next. When a issue or merge request is assigned to you, you or or when you at mention in a comment, this will trigger a new item on your to-do list automatically. And as you will always know what to work on next. Pretty cool. Here I'm guessing we have, yeah, profile. Oh, look at that little activity thing. Groups, contributor, personal projects, snippets, uh, settings. Do, 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 typical settings kind of stuff. Ooh, look at that. You can add SSH keys. SSH keys allow you to establish a secure connection between your computer and GitLab. Before you add SSH keys, generate one or use an existing one. Pretty cool. You can also add GPG keys. Pretty cool. Uh, probably do that later. Oh, this one is getting me, uh, getting me stuffy. Uh, let's see. So let's see about creating a project, create group, please for learn more about GitLab. So let's see here. GitLab, here's your documentation, API, search. Uh, that we're gonna start with the create here. So let's start with the projects here. It says here in GitLab you create projects for hosting your code base. Use it as an issue track, collaborate on code, and continuously build, test, and deploy your app with built-in GitLab CICD. Your projects are can be available publicly, internally, or privately at your choice. GitLab does not limit the number of private projects you create. Uh, when you create a project in GitLab, you have access to a, number, a large number of features. So this is what that has. A web IDE, look at that. Issues and merge requests, GitLab CI. Other features, wiki, document your GitLab project in integrated wiki, snippets, store and share collaborate code on code snippets, uh, cycle analytics, index highlighting, batches, project integrations, new projects, integrate your project with Jira, Mattermost, Kubernetes, Slack, and more. Uh, new project, learn how to create a new project in GitLab. Fork a project, project settings, import or export a project, 
Import project from GitHub to GitLab, Big Bucket, Gitia, uh, Fogbugs. That's an interesting name for that. <laughs> uh, project members, leave a project, redirects. Interesting. So here we go. How to create a project in GitLab for a list of words that are not allowed to be used as project names, see reserved names. In your dashboard, click create new project button or use a plus icon to open navigation bar. This opens a new project page. So it's over here. We have uh, create project. Yep, same page. Uh, this opens a new project page. So it's going to look like this. Sure enough, it does look like that. Alrighty, choose if you want to start a blank project or with one of the predefined project templates. This will kickstart repository code and CI automatically. Otherwise, if you have a project in a different repository, you can import it by clicking in the import projects tab. Provided this, uh, this is enabled in your GitLab instance, ask your administrator if not. And now we have provide information, enter the name of your project in the project field, uh, project name field. You can't use special characters, but you can use spaces, hyphens, underscores, or even emoji. <sighs> wow, you can use emojis. It's pretty cool. Uh, project description, optional. Field enables uh, you to enter a description for your project's dashboard, which will help you others understand uh, what your project is about. Though it's not required, it's a good idea to fill this in. Uh, okay. Uh, changing the visibility. It modifies the project's viewing and access rights for users. Uh, okay. Create a project. Push and create a new project. Okay, let's see here. Oh man, I need to sneeze. Give me a minute. <coughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Sorry about that. Okay. Push to create a new project introduced in GitLab 10.5. Uh, when you create a new repo locally, instead of going to GitLab Manage to create a project, they push the repo. You can. Uh, and then push the repo, you can directly push to GitLab create new project all without leaving your terminal. If you have access to that namespace, you can, it will automatically create a new project under GitLab namespaces and the visibility will be set to private by default. You can later change that in the project settings. This can be done using either SSH or HTTP. Oh, there you go. It's kind of like, see, th this here is obviously like GitHub, you know, where you could create a local project and then push it. But of course, in, Git, in GitHub, you would have to create the project there first, and then you would push it up there. Um, so here, you can basically just create it from a local instance. Here it says, uh, git push using SSH, git push set upstream GitLab at gitlab.example.com, namespace non existent project at git master uh, using HTTP. Interesting. So this is kind of like a pretty big, uh, pretty big difference when starting off a new project between GitLab and GitHub. Um, it kind of makes sense because you know if you were using the open core, uh, you were hosting this on your own. It would just make sense that you could do it locally up to whatever server you're using. And it's interesting that you could do it to their servers as well, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, once the push finishes successfully, a remote message will indicate the command to set the remote and the URL to a new project. Okay, so you can start getting this prompt and then the private project namespace system was created to configure the remote run git remote at origin, you know, big URL there. To view this project, visit blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's pretty neat. Uh, Oh, someone had a little funny error there. <laughs> That's funny. So basically we can either do the traditional way, like the GitHub kind of way to do create a new project. Um, or we can just do it from our local repo. Uh, so I really don't have a local repo that I can think of that can do this. I mean, obviously you don't, you don't have to have one. You could just easily create one. Um, but let's go ahead and you know what, let's maybe try both, both, uh, both ways. Let's see here. This, let's try this new project here, uh, the, via the, wait, wait, the phrase. So here we have a new project. A project is where you house your files, repository, plan your work issues, and publish your documentation wiki, uh, among other things. 
All features are enabled for black projects from templates or even uh, when you're importing, but you can disable them afterwards in the project settings. To use CI CD features for an external repository, choose CI CD for external repository. Tip, you can also create a project from the command line and it shows you the commands, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, definitely a pretty cool thing to, um, to be able to do that from the command line. So, okay, so create black project, create from project, import project, CI external demo. Oh, look at that. Ruby on Rails template, Spring, and Node.js Express. That's pretty cool. Uh, but let's go ahead and just start a blank project for now. Okay, so uh, project path. Okay, that's I want to have several dependent projects on the same as created group. Uh, project name, description, private internal. Users and any other user public authentication. So, what should we do here? So I don't know. Let's maybe create something. I'm sorry about the noise. Pretty straightforward. I don't know. Um, STX LUG um, demo. This is a demo for South Texas Linux user group. In this demo, we have demonstrated how to create a black project in GitLab. Let's go ahead and make it public and create. You won't be able to pull or push project code via SSH into you and SSH keep to your profile. Okay. Uh, let's see what we have here. Project SEO demo was successfully created. So here we go. This is the demo for blah, blah, blah. Here is the URL for that, and SSH or HTTPS. The repository for this project is empty. If you already have files, you can push, use the command line instructions below. Note, this master branch is automatically protected. Learn about protected branches. You can automatically build and test your application if you enabled auto DevOps for this project. You can automatically deploy it as well if you have a Kubernetes cluster. Otherwise, it is recommended to start from one of these options below. So we have a new file of a readme, uh, oh, look at that. That's your creator right there. That's pretty cool. Uh, add a license, enable auto dope, add Kubernetes cluster. Command line instructions, git global setup, git config, blah, blah, blah. Get create, uh, create a new repository, git lab clone, git clone, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is pretty much like GitHub. Pretty much, I mean, of course, it's Git, so it's gonna pretty much work the same way. Uh, or an existing folder, cd to git init remote origin. Okay, yeah, existing Git repository. Okay. So, obviously, since we're creating a new repository, yes. Okay. Okay. I'm not the biggest Git user, <laughs> so excuse me if like I'm taking a little, a bit of time here to kind of kind of go through this here. But I just want to make sure I get it right. Um, I'm sorry, my chair is giving me problems. Okay, so let's see here. Git clone. Create new repository, git clone. Okay, so this is, uh, so obviously this is, this is what you do um, to basically configure your local environment to basically use you know, your username and then use your email. That's so that, you know, whenever you push, uh, you know, whenever you push or you try to merge something into a new repository, uh, whoever is basically the owner of that repository knows who is, you know, sending up information up to it. And then they could, you know, obviously merge it into the project or basically, some, you know, accept all kinds of, you know, you know, uh, excuse me, so they can accept your merges into their project. So, and then create new repository. So this little step here, let's say you don't have a local instance of repository. So if you wanted to 
uh, basically you have a local instance of that repository, you would do a git clone and then the URL to that uh, repo. Then you would move into that folder, uh, basically you created that or repo, and then you would basically create a file, which would be touchread.md, which is the readme file, which basically all repos or uh, most projects all have a readme file. And then you would git add readme.md. And basically you're telling git to basically uh, what's the word? Basically put up the this file to be added to the to the remote repository. So in other words, you're telling Git, okay, grab this local file and put it here for now because I want to put it into the remote repository. So the next step puts that you know local file into that remote repository. Uh, well, next two steps. So the commit uh, basically. It's basically you're telling Git, hey, Git, I have this local file, right? Now, I'm pretty sure I want to add this local file up to the repository. So I'm committed. So, all right, you ready? get ready to send it, all right? So, and you do the dash M, you know, uh, and then add a little message there because the dash M is for message. So you always want to add a message as to when you're committing something. Basically, you're telling basically because you're gonna tell uh, whenever you commit something and you see it within the the source tree, you'll see those messages like, "Hey, I'm adding this new feature, or I removed this feature, or we fixed this feature, or we fixed that bug, or we did this, we did that." So that's why you're adding messages so that people constantly know what's going on at that point in the whole source uh, control thing, version control. Uh, and then finally, git push to dash u origin master. This is th this is like basically saying, okay, I've added this local file. I'm pretty sure I'm going to add this local file up to the repository. So now for sure, add this local file to the remote repository. So that's what git push uh, dash u origin stands for. And the origin master uh, is basically kind of like, uh, it's, a, it's a way of uh, basically stating this is the this this is oh man. I'm really bad at Git. <laughs> uh, it's basically saying uh, this is like the main the main the main source of uh, our. Uh, okay, think of a, of a folder structure. So you have your root folder, and then you have other folders within that, right? So when you're you trying to add a new file, you have to tell it to which folder you want to set it to. So when you say origin master, you're basically saying it to the root directory kind of idea, I think. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. I may be completely wrong. <laughs> Again, I'm not the best Git user. Uh, so, okay. So that's basically how you create a new repository from basically your uh, local environment. So let, let's say you already have that local environment. You have the existing folder. So obviously you would you know cd into that existing folder and you do a git init which is basically you're telling git to your local instance of git you're telling it to initialize or basically saying hey get ready because you're going to do stuff inside this folder and uh more likely you're going to be adding it to a remote repository so just get yourself ready all right so and then you tell git to remote add origin to the whatever url of the repo so basically you're telling it okay git now that you're ready I want you to add, you know, all the contents that are in here, all the contents that are inside this folder that you got ready for. I want you to add it to this origin uh, repo. Basically, again, origin to basically the root directory of the repo. I want you to add it to this repo. Okay, cool. Now you 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 ready to add that? Okay, cool. So now we're gonna I'm gonna you're basically gonna say git add, you know, and then uh, put a dot there. What this is saying right here, git add dot, uh, git add and then dot, it's basically saying, okay, git, add everything that's inside this folder, inside this directory. I want you to add everything that's in there. And so that's why you put the dot there. So uh, before we saw git add readme. So what this was saying is that only add this single file. If you want to add all the contents inside a directory, you would do a dot. You can also tell it individual files. So you so like if you could do readme.md and then space, add the next file, and then space, add the next file, and space, add the next file. 
or you could do you can also do um, um uh wild cards so if you have several fi- files with you know the uh, basically the let's say you want to upload several uh, markdown files or several php files you just you can do you can add a wild card there and it will add there all those files that you want to add uh, but when you have an existing folder this is a new uh repository and you're adding it to your remote origin and you want to add everything within your local environment up to that remote uh, repo, this is how you would do it super quick. So git add space dot. So now you have told git, hey, add everything that's in this directory and you're going to tell it, okay, git commit dash m initial commit. Basically saying, okay, I'm pretty sure I want to add everything that's in here. Everything I told you to add, I'm pretty sure I'm going to want to, I'm going to, I'm committing to moving it to the remote repository. So again, dash M for the message and the message initial commit. It's just a little thing that you put in there. Okay, this is the first time I'm uploading everything up here. This is my first commit. And then finally, push origin dash U uh, or, I mean, sorry, git push dash U origin master. Just like before, just telling it, put it in the root directory of this repo, uh, which is origin master. (laughs) Okay, so finally we have existing git repository. So let's say you already have a Git repository somewhere. And let's again, let's say like you have it on GitHub or something. And you want to take that remote repository and push it to your existing uh, GitLab repository. So you would CD into remote uh, existing repo, Git remote, rename origin to old origin. And then Git remote, basically you're telling it, okay, you know that, hey Git, you know that uh, remote repository that it's in here that you basically know about and all that? Well, yeah, I want you to rename it from origin to old re- uh, origin because, you know, I'm moving basically directories from that, that old directory to this new directory, from that old repo to this new repo. So just, I want you to get, I want you to know that. I want you to know that that's what I'm doing. So the next step, we get remote at origin, get lab, blah, blah, blah. So now that you told it that you're going to rename it and that it knows that you basically are moving from an old repository to a new rem- remote pos- repository, now you tell it which new repository you're going to be adding. So once you do that, then you do the, the typical push, uh, get push dash you origin dash dash all. So basically you're telling it, okay, everything from that old uh, origin, you're going to move it into this one. So just move it. Like I don't even need to commit it. Just go ahead and do it because I know what's in there and I, I'm pretty sure I know what I'm going to do. And then obviously you want to add all the tags. This the tags is basically like, uh, you know, uh, I guess I guess you could think of them like, at what, like a, a way of showing you at what stage that code was in so yeah that's kind of like what's going on with there um so since we're going to create a new project i mean of course we could do it here within the web interface but let's do it locally so first we have to get a global setup uh locally so let's see if uh if i fail horribly at this uh let me move you guys i'm gonna go ahead and i'm pulling out my terminal now and I'm trying to change the text size so you guys can see it a bit better. Excuse me. Um, enlarge font. Enlarge font. Enlarge font. Enlarge font. Now make this bigger. Okay, so. Alrighty. So you guys should now be able to see my terminal. Um, oh, and I also forgot to mention early on, I'm using KDE Neon as my distribution of choice. Um, uh, you know, I, I liked KDE. I was using KDE a while ago, and man, it was KDE was one of those things that was like it was so cool, but it had so many annoying options. Oh my god, it was it was so bad. And the laptop I had at the time, for whatever reason. Oh, I'm sorry, KDE, for whatever reason, the sound settings, they were set to the most insane defaults. So one good example was that the default was full volume for all desktop sounds. 
So whenever I get a notification on the desktop for anything, it will come full volume through my speakers and it would be the worst when I would have my headphones on, like a notification would come in and it would just blast my headphones. It would just, oh my God, it drove me crazy. So that's kind of like, this was maybe four years ago. That's one of the reasons I totally said, okay, Katie, later, like bye Felicia, because it was like, oh my God, it was just so, it was so annoying having to work with those default settings. But now KDE Neon is a new distribution, or maybe not distribution, but it's it's basically a, a, a it's basically Ubuntu stable, and they built the latest uh, KDE uh, desktop on top of it, and they ship it out to you, and it comes with sane defaults. So they, all that sound craziness and all that stuff is just out the window, and they give you something that you can work with. So I've been having a lot of fun using KDE Neon. It's pretty cool. Uh, I kind of customized it myself using this, this theme stuff and all that. And my terminal here, uh, I'm not using the, the the standard Bash terminal. I'm using Z is uh, the Z shell with uh, basically a oh, oh, um, oh my ZSH ZSH. Uh, your configurations on it, so that's why it looks a little different from the standard Bash terminal. Uh, but yeah, so anyways, let's get back to what we're doing over here. So I'm going to make the text a little bit bigger, just a little bit bigger. So just in case everybody can see, because I know sometimes people open up terminals and it just you can't see it at all, you know, uh, uh, on screen. And it gets really hard and, you know, you're trying to squint your eyes or you're trying to like, I don't know, do a lot of different cool little tricks to make sure you can see the screen and all that. So I think I think you guys can probably get a good idea what's going on there um so let's go ahead and follow the instructions down here for the global setup it's pretty straightforward really easy commands so let's go ahead and do git sorry git config dash dash global uh user dot name and again this is just if you've ever used github this is basically the same process because again it's built on git so yeah so we have, I think I have git installed. I don't know, we'll find out. Okay, perfect, it worked. So git config dash dash global user dot email. And then that's the email I'm gonna use. You could change the email here if you'd like. Um, here I have the info one from my uh, personal domain. Um, here I could change it to, I don't know, if I wanted to, I could just put like, I don't know, git whatever, but I'm, of course I don't have that, you know, email. I only have, I have the info one here. So okay, that's again, totally completely optional. So git config dash uh, global dot, sorry, dash dash global space user dot email. And then, okay, that's correct. So perfect. So now we can move on to create a new repository. So, and let's, first of all, before we do that, let's find out where I'm at. I should be, I think actually, let's go. I know I have a projects directory, which I put most of my stuff in there. So hopefully nothing embarrassing is in here. Yeah, should be good. So uh, now let's go ahead and create that new repository. So now we move into my projects directory. Um, which is where I host most of my projects. So git clone locally. I should host my projects locally here. HTTPS uh, gitlab.com slash ERWTC. I don't know why I didn't just uh, copy paste this in there instead of writing it all out, but whatever. Okay, so git clone HTTPS uh, gitlab.com ERWTC stx log dash demo dot git. So, should get clone. Beautiful. A warning, you appear to have cloned an empty repository. Checking connectivity, done. Of course, it's empty because we didn't put anything on there in the, in the web interface. So, we got a CD into that. Perfect. Now we are in our repository, as you see here. And this is a cool thing about that I like about the Z shell and the, the customization that I have, that when you're using Git, it'll tell you uh, which basically, uh, uh, which level you are in the repo. And it'll tell you whether or not if uh, you've made any commits or changes to that repo. 
in just this little short little space here. It's 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 really cool. I don't know. It's one of those neat little nerdy things about it. Uh, especially if you're, when you're working with Git a lot, that's really handy just to kind of quickly look at your terminal and know exactly where you're at. So now we've CD'd and we're into it. So now let's go ahead and create that readme file. So readme md boom so if we do it see oh here's a cool example so over here nothing has changed but obviously we created a new file so something has changed so it tells you see that's pretty cool right <laughs> uh so go ahead let's uh ls and sure enough we have something in there so another reason that for that uh, the reason i did the ls real quick to kind of show you again so again, the reason this is really cool when you, when you have uh, the Z shell installed and specifically this uh, customizations installed, um, let's say you, you, you were okay, you committed everything, you pushed everything and you're back to normal in your in normal status, uh, status, excuse me, um, in your repo and everything is good and green. But let's say you created this touch uh, readme file or any other file, or whatever, or you did another commit to whatever, uh, your repo. And let's say you got distracted, you had to move away real quick. So like, again, kind of simulate a distraction. I, I got distracted, I'm back over here. Um, I'm looking through documentation or whatever. And, you know, I'm reading the documentation and I completely forgot that I hadn't committed that file or that I made a change to my repo and I haven't committed to it or I haven't added that, you know, that change to my repo. So the reason, you know, you have those little um, signifiers in the terminal. The way I have it customized is to basically remind you of that. So you can come back and be like, oh, no, like you, you can see your real quick. You can see that, you know, in your terminal, it's showing you, uh, oh, man, like I have uh, I have I made a change here and I haven't committed that change or I haven't added that change. I need to make sure that I put my repo back to its, uh, you know, uh, original state so that's kind of like the cool little thing about that you know um that's why it's it's pretty neat to have this little option there uh, because it'll remind you it'll remind you that you made a change and you should fix that um to make sure that your repo is all in you know that you are concurrent with your repo and that you are in the most uh up-to-date um changes with your repo so now that we did the touch readme, we basically added that readme file. Let's go ahead and uh, maybe uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and um, add something to that readme file, just so that it's not a blank file, you know. So let's do nano. Uh, let's go ahead and add since it's a markdown file. I believe if we just do that, uh, hello world. Uh, let's do something better. Uh, welcome to this demo. So welcome. Uh, man, I don't remember my markdown. Hopefully this is correct. Actually, no, let's not do the double bang. I think it's just do bold. Just star star welcome. Welcome. And then we could do um, this is a demo. In this demonstration, we showed how to get started with GitLab. So, okay, that looks good. Let's modify this. Yes, yes, okay. Um, okay, perfect. So we could do this quick cat of readme here just to see the contents of it, perfect, yes. Uh, okay, so now that we did that, we can now continue on to the next step, which is git add readme.md. Uh, git add uh, readme.md, and just like that, beautiful. So obviously uh, you may have noticed that it doesn't give you any feedback. Um, so this is kind of like where the whole like understanding how git works and you know how like it there's no interactive mode basically so you kind of have to kind of go through the process and of course practice makes perfect and you'll understand all, all this stuff there are some uh, commands that will give you feedback and they are a little bit more interactive so just it's just a little heads up 
So in our commit, our next step here is uh, we're gonna commit. So, and in our message, we're just gonna add the standard, you know, what they have there. So I git commit uh, dash M uh, and then our message would be add readme. There we go. So this one gave us some feedback. So now, uh, so git commit dash M readme and it says master root commit. And then it gives you a little, um, I guess, not a time step, but I guess it's more of a, um, a tag, I guess you could say, like uh, letting you know at this at this step something was added. So add readme file changed five insertions, you know the plus sign of stuff that was added, create mode, and then blah blah blah. So uh, one cool thing that you can see now when we committed something, it means that our our repo is back to its original state. Like basically everything's good. So here, everything wasn't good, but now things are all fine and dandy, see? But just because we committed it doesn't mean that it's up in the remote repository. Committing just means that we ensured that the state of our repo is like basically okay. Or, man, again, I'm not the best with Git. If someone out there is better with Git and can explain this, just you know, go ahead and comment below how it works but basically we're just saying that the, the 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 local repo is cool it's good like everything any changes you made to it have been cleared and everything's up to date in your local repository but in the in the remote repository those changes aren't added yet so how do we add those local changes up to the remote well that's where the last step comes in so we have git push dash u origin master and again, this will then, I got, man, I'm terrible at spelling. Pook, pooch, push, there we go. Git push, uh, dash u origin master. So this will then move all those local changes up to the remote repository. So there we go. So we have to then add our username, which is ERWTC. And then the password for that, which I have, where do I have that? Uh, okay, yeah. Let me copy that real quick. Excuse me, guys. Okay, now paste. I think that's right. Perfect, it worked. So, again, whenever, uh, whenever you uh, are pushing something to Origin Master uh, up to the remote repository, uh, it's gonna prompt you for username or password. You can you can go into the configurations, uh, local configurations of Git, and add this stuff, so it won't be prompting you for that anymore. But uh, you know, it's just this is a good example to show you that it, it will prompt you for username and password. Uh, so then it's gonna go through everything. It's gonna figure out okay, local changes have changed. It's gonna do that. Uh, it's gonna compress all that stuff because it you know needs to transmit it. So it's gonna compress it a little bit. Uh, compressing objects, 100% done, writing objects. So then once it compresses and sends that uh, data up, it's gonna write it to the remote repository and then it's gonna tell you, okay, what's changed. And then it's gonna tell you to where and then it's gonna tell you how. So from new branch to master master and branch master is set up to track remote repository from origin. So yeah, all that fancy mumbo jumbo, basically what all that means is that your local repository which you committed to it and you made sure it was all good and you're happy with everything in the local repository. So now that you're happy with everything, how everything's in the local repository, you then moved or not moved. You made it basically a, all those changes, you put them up onto a remote repository. So that's how basically how Git works. Like you have a remote repository somewhere that stays basically in a constant state uh, of like, not in a constant state, I should say. It, it stays in, like, that's... Think of a document, right? You have... You have already worked on a document. It's already been edited and everything. And you like that document. You are happy with all the changes that are with that document. That document now is... Think of it as your remote repository. So you come back to it, like, in a week. And you're like, you know what? I came up with a better sentence at the end of that document. So you went and then made changes to that document. And then you made those changes locally. And then when you are ready to change the original document, you tell, you're basically telling Git, hey, Git, I made these changes to this local document. Now change it to the document I was happy with a week ago. 
So that's basically kind of like the process that we went through now. So we had a local document or local repository that we had, and we made changes to it. And then we, when we were happy with those changes, we basically told Git, hey, Git, I'm happy with all the changes here. Make sure you know that. And then now that it knows that, I'm ready to push all those changes to a remote repository that kind of keeps track of all those long-term happy changes that I'm you know, making. So that think of the remote repository as like, not the final product, but think of it like as the state in which you are always happy with that project. Um, so you know you're happy with that project and that's like your happy place, that remote repository. The local one is where you're not happy with it and you're always changing it and you're fixing things, removing things, adding things, all kinds of things to that local one. And then once you get to a happy place, of that local one, then you can move those changes up to the one to the remote repository. So that's kind of like how Git works in a very layman's turn. <laughs> I mean, I'm probably completely off the rails here and not correct on any of that. <laughs> but again, I'm not the best Git uh, uh, user or uh, you know person who you know you know, is like an expert at Git or you know at least really good at version control. So. Now you may be thinking, okay, we did all that, but what the hell does that mean? Like what? Like what? So if we refresh it here, we should see that README file now. And sure enough, there it is, the README file. And it tells you who authored it, uh, at what time, and then the timestamp. See, remember this timestamp? Oh, not timestamp, but this little, man, I don't know what the hell they call it, but this little thing here, this ID thing. We saw it over here too, right there. So that's how like the little, two, that's kind of like how you make sure that stuff works. So, and of course, then it shows you uh, the output of that readme file, which is right here. Welcome, this is the demo and the demonstration we showed you how to get, in this demonstration we showed you how to get started with GitLab. So there we go. Isn't that pretty cool? So that's how basically that works. So, like, so for example, now this is the ultimate happy state that we have uh, our remote repository on and this is going to stay like that until we push uh, local changes up to it so a good example is that i've noticed here that i did not do my markdown uh, uh you know markup correctly so let's say i want to change that so we can go back over here to our terminal and then we can we can basically edit that readme document again and I believe it's, I thought you had to leave a space, but apparently I guess you don't. Uh, but yeah, let's see if that works. We modify changes, yes, and then write that. So as you see, we were happy state here, and then one longer in a happy state. So we got to fix that. And the way we fix it is you basically just follow the same steps that we did over here. So whenever we uh, basically would start from, excuse me, this stage right here, git add readme. Git add readme. Beautiful. And then after that state, we have to do this one, git commit. Of course, we're going to change the message. And let's see, fixing. Um, bold uh, typo. Beautiful. Worked. So now, oh, see, this is... Uh, See master fixing bold title, one file change, one insertion, and one deletion. That meant, you know, the stuff that we added and one stuff that we deleted. So it tells you, it keeps track of the stuff that you've, the changes you made to a document or to any files that you made. Uh, so then now we do the same thing, git push or dash u origin. Because we're happy with all the changes we made. We're pretty sure with all the changes we made. So now we want to make sure that this local repository matches the one uh, remote one. Because right now this remote one has it like this. But the local one has it like this. See, no spaces. So we want to make sure that whatever is here in the local one is the same here. So the way we do that is basically by pit, git push dash u origin master. And it should ask me for the login again, your dbtc. And then I think my password is still saved. Beautiful. There we go. Uh, it tells you again, same thing. 
so if we do a quick refresh over here, there we go, all fixed, look at that. It's in bold, just like it's supposed to be. Uh, so that's, okay, oh, and you see over here, uh, less comment, fixing bold typo one minute ago. Um, and then here it gives you the little, uh, man, what is this dude called copy? Commit. I guess it's a, I don't know, a little, a little stamp for each commit or something. I don't know. I need to figure out what that means. <laughs> um, so again, this is how basically version control with Git works. And this is how GitLab works, or how it does its version control, which is very similar to the way GitHub does it. There's really no difference because underlying, they're both using Git. And Git, you know, can only do, it already has its set of functions and how it works. So, yeah. Um, so, like, for example, if we wanted to add any of these things, so add a change log, add a license file, a, a contribution guide, and all that kind of stuff, we can add those via the, the, the web uh, interface here. Or we can also add it via the, you know, local, the terminal uh, interface as well. Uh, so, yeah, that's how basically how GitLab works and how Git works. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Again, I'm not the best Git user, so I can't give you any more in-depth detail about how Git works or anything like that. Uh, but we can go through the little, uh, we go through these little things again. So here, this is, this is your branches. So this is your master branch. Uh, you can obviously create other branches. So branch and new tag. The reason you create branches is because, so for example, let's say you are in a repository that you are really, really happy with and you don't want to change any major components or even a small component of that repository because you're really happy with it. You you are, it. you know, everything's working. All the code that's in there is working. Um, you just, there's no reason for you to really change it. Or let's say that all the code in there is working or it's not working and you're basically gonna rechange everything, but you're still gonna use a lot of good uh, components or co code uh, from this master one. So you, you would then create a new branch and say like, so a good example of that, for example, is like, let's say you had a dot um, version, uh, version one of your code and you're gonna move to version two. And of course, version two has some of the same underlying features and code of version one, but it's going to be basically completely different. So you would create a new branch. And so you have a new branch for like version two. But, you know, I'm sure you're thinking, well, why not just fork it or create another like uh, repository for it? Well, let's say that you're going to keep working on both version one and version two at the same time because of a support you know reason or whatever that's why you would create a new branch basically um you can also again like i said before you can you can fork uh a, a repo and basically what that means is like okay up to this point i like you know like let's say someone else comes in let's say i don't know um linus torvalds whatever <laughs> comes to and sees his repository and he's like hey I like this stuff. I like everything up to this point. I like the way this repo is is at right now. But I think it would be better off if I were to make changes to it. And I don't want to make changes to the original repo. I just kind of like like it the way it is now. And I want to make changes for you know different stuff. I want to add additional features that I know that this project doesn't care about. Or, you know, maybe they don't have the manpower to be able to contain, to be able to continue the, with the kind of changes that I want to implement. So I'll go ahead and just fork it. And then I'll start, you know, making those changes on my own. And I fork it at this point because I know that I like it at this point. And when I make those changes, this is the most beneficial place to fork this um, this repository. So that's what, that's what a fork is. Uh, branches... So that's the, kind of the difference between branches and forks. Um, I mean, it's kind of like the same thing. In my brain, that's kind of like the same thing. I don't know. There may be some complete underlying differences between both of them. Uh, but in my brain, that's how they kind of function. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, the, yeah, this, this is this is Git, guys. This is how uh, uh, you know GitLab functions, basically like GitHub. 
Um, I'll go ahead and leave this uh, this, uh, this repo here. So if you guys want to, I don't know, commit to it, <laughs> uh, I can probably add uh, any of y'all's commits to it if y'all want to. Um, I think I, I think I'm allowed to have a have an open public repo under the free plan i think i don't remember i'll have to look into that um but yeah anyways so yeah